It is uh, Thursday, March 3rd, uh, 2022. This is the Senate Energy and Utilities Policy and Finance Committee. Uh, today, we're going to uh, uh, deal only with information. There are no bills, but uh, we want to hear a little bit more about hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, the fuel of the future, the clean fuel of the future. Uh, the world's on, uh, I won't say literally on fire over hydrogen, but, but certainly the energy world is, as we all know, uh, uh, vis-a-vis the federal infrastructure bill and a lot of other things that are happening uh, not only across our nation but across our world in this area and uh, and so what we wanted to do is hear from a couple of uh, uh, parties within Minnesota that are involved in hydrogen in particular one of them of course is uh, the University of Morris and uh, Mr. Mike Reese who's with us today and the, the work that they did out they are doing out there that we funded uh, last uh, in the last uh, energy bill that we had in addition to that, a uh, uh, project that's involved in uh, XL Energy, which I don't think we've necessarily heard about it in this committee, uh, only in the newspaper, we've read about it. Uh, we know it's good and uh, good things are happening there as well. But So what we wanna do again, just uh, ha have our questions answered, uh, maybe have these individuals speculate a little bit on the future of hydrogen in Minnesota, how it, how it might work, uh, how we might uh, be of assistance to making it work if that's necessary. But uh, Mr. Mike Reese, welcome to our committee and uh, proceed as you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for the record, my name is Michael Reese. And for the past 21 years, I have served as the director of the Renewable Energy Program at the University of Minnesota West Central Research and Outreach Center located near the city of Morris. Let me begin by thanking this committee for supporting the Ammonia RDA funding providing during the last legislative session. I'll provide a progress update as part of my testimony, but first wish to begin uh, with the concluding message. In my opinion, zero carbon hydrogen and ammonia offer substantial and dynamic economic opportunities for the state of Minnesota. Cultivating a business environment that promotes the production and utilization of zero carbon hydrogen and ammonia, along with the accompanying infrastructure, supply chain, and manufacturing base for the necessary components will have a broad, deep, and long lasting benefit across the entire state. With this outlook, a group of Minnesota and Midwest stakeholders are currently leading an effort to establish a federally funded Midwest Hydrogen Hub. The working theme of the Midwest Hydrogen Hub is decarbonizing Midwest industry and utilities through zero carbon hydrogen. Hydrogen offers exciting opportunities for the Midwest, but perhaps in a different context than other regions of the country. First of all, we have multiple paths of production in the Midwest using wind and solar energy, natural gas uh, with carbon capture and sequestration, nuclear power and other production routes such as biogas fermentation, or excuse me, biogas reformation and biomass gasification. Today I'll focus primarily on using wind and solar energy to produce what is referred to as green hydrogen and green ammonia. As for the utilization of hydrogen, I believe the Midwest has better use cases for green hydrogen. Let me provide a quick primer and let's then let's visit briefly about these uses. Hydrogen or H2, is an energy carrier and a building block for vitally important chemicals such as nitrogen fertilizer. Hydrogen itself can be combusted in engines and burners. It can be used to produce electricity with fuel cells and it can be combined with other molecules to form fertilizers and both liquid and gaseous fuels. Hydrogen fuel or H2 has its challenges, especially from the standpoint of the cost of storage and transportation. This is where our research efforts in green ammonia production come into play. Combining hydrogen with nitrogen through what is called the Haber-Bosch process forms in hydrous ammonia or NH3, which is roughly 10 times less expensive to store and transport than hydrogen. We currently use gray ammonia, ammonia which is produced from natural gas steam methane reforming, extensively across Minnesota for providing nitrogen to our corn and small grain crops. Ammonia is also a precursor to other forms of synthetic nitrogen fertilizers used in Minnesota. Because ammonia has a high percentage of hydrogen, it can also be used as an energy source similar to hydrogen and hydrocarbons such as natural gas. Ammonia can be combusted in engines and burners and used directly in certain types of fuel cells. Ammonia can also be cracked back into pure hydrogen. Much of our team's focus has been on techno-economics of using green ammonia for storing and tra transporting hydrogen. Therefore, we have a good understanding of the benefits of converting hydrogen into ammonia. To provide some context for our research, let's visit about how zero carbon hydrogen and ammonia may be used to decarbonize Midwest industries. Uh, decarbonizing steel and production, steel production and mining. 
Steel production represents about 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. Fossil fuels used in heavy mining equipment may be replaced with zero carbon ammonia fuel. Similarly, fossil fuels used in the production of iron pellets, as well as in the carbon purification process, can be displaced by green hydrogen. Minnesota could potentially process steel within the state and become an exporter of green steel. Similar efforts like this are underway in northern Sweden and in the Iberian Peninsula to produce green steel. The automaker Volvo is purchasing the steel from the Swedish mills. The second is decarbonized agriculture. Nitrogen fertilizer is the next largest worldwide contributor of greenhouse gas emissions at 2%. The Midwest has the greatest concentration and largest density of corn and small grain production in the United States, if not the world. From our research, roughly 35% of the fossil energy footprint of corn production is related to nitrogen fertilizer. Green hydrogen can be used in the manufacture of ammonia, which is a drop-in replacement for what farmers currently use. Green ammonia may be also used to fuel grain dryers, which represents another 45% of the fossil energy footprint of corn production. And finally, green ammonia can be used to fuel tractors and trucks. In combination, we could reduce the fossil energy footprint of corn production over 90%. I believe that this is truly transformational. In turn, the fossil energy footprint of meat, dairy, and biofuel production would be significantly decreased. Decarbonized biofuel production. The ethanol industry currently emits significant levels of CO2 from fermentation. To maintain competitiveness, competitiveness within this market, the CO2 will need to be sequestered in the next two to five years, either through piping the CO2 to deep wells in North Dakota or Illinois, or through utilization in chemical production. Green hydrogen could be a key to capturing and utilizing this CO2 through urea, which is granular nitrogen fertilizer, aviation fuel, methanol, and other forms of fuels and chemicals. This will be a paradigm shift within the Midwest biofuels industry and put the industry on a path towards long-term stability and sustainability. Decarbonize the construction industry. Zero carbon hydrogen can be combusted for thermal energy within the concrete production process. Quick lime is used for concrete production. Within the manufacturing process of quick lime, limestone mined in Minnesota quarries is heated in kilns. Green hydrogen or ammonia can displace the fossil fuels used in this process. Heating limestone also drives off CO2. Similar to the biofuel fermentation, this CO2 may be captured and combined with hydrogen or ammonia to produce fertilizers and liquid fuels. Decarbonize heavy, heavy vehicles and transportation. Green hydrogen and ammonia may be used for marine bunker fuel as well as train engines. Ammonia may also fuel the ore ships on Lake Superior and the barges and barges on the Mississippi River. Major shipbuilders around the world are currently evaluating the use of green ammonia in marine engines with some ammonia fueled ships now entering service. Decarbonizing the electric and natural gas industry. In order for electric utilities to reach 80 to 100% renewable power generation, seasonal storage is needed. The cost of storing electricity seasonally in batteries is exceedingly expensive. Excess wind and solar can be used to produce hydrogen and ammonia, which can then fuel power generation when load, when load demands. For the gas industry, green hydrogen and ammonia can also be used to displace natural gas for thermal energy applications critically important for Northern climates like Minnesota. Again, the potential economic impact of zero carbon hydrogen and ammonia in utilization is significant and reaches almost every major industry in every corner of the state. In addition, by converting to processes that use renewable or zero carbon electric energy to produce fertilizers and fuels, we will harden our economy to the market swing seen within the fossil fuel industry. Thank you for allowing me to provide this context prior to providing an update on our green ammonia research. State of Minnesota has a long history in supporting hydrogen and ammonia research at the University of Minnesota. That support has enabled the university to become a world leader in this field. In 2006 and 2007, the University of Minnesota received funding from the state to construct a hydrogen and ammonia pilot plant that would be powered by an existing utility scale wind turbine. The concept was that hydrogen could be used to store wind energy. The stored hydrogen could either be used for power generation or for producing anhydrous ammonia to be used as nitrogen fertilizer. The vision was that a cooperative of farmers with wind turbines located on their land would be able to use excess and stranded wind er energy to produce nitrogen fertilizer to nourish the crops surrounding the wind farm to seem like an elegant model. Construction on the pilot plant began in 2009, hydrogen in production Hydrogen production utilization for power generation was commissioned in 2010, and the ammonia portion of the pilot was commissioned in 2013. 
At the time, the wind to ammonia pilot plant uh, was located at the research farm was the first in the world. The pilot plant has been run successfully since commissioning and is used to gather baseline research data as well as to test innovative improvements. Results have demonstrated that using wind energy to produce ammonia is technically feasible, but economically challenging to do so at small scale. Technical improvements were required to compete with conventional large scale production. One of the improvements developed at the University of Minnesota is a novel ammonia separation process added on to the conventional Haber-Bosch ammonia production. Absorbents such as magnesium chloride are used to remove ammonia from mixed process gases at higher temperatures, thereby potentially decreasing capital and operating costs. This system has been tested successfully within the pilot plant. Additional research was started on the utilization of ammonia as a fuel. Some of the results of our past efforts have been that uh, hydrogen and ammonia can be produced from intermittent wind and solar PV. Uh, ammonia can be used for, 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 as a fuel for engines by cracking a small portion of the ammonia back into hydrogen. Ammonia combustion for thermal energy is possible using the same technology. Ammonia separation as part of the Haber-Bosch process can be accomplished with smaller scale systems at lower capital costs using supported absorbents. A techno-economic study was completed in 2020 by uh, colleagues Matt Pallas and Perdomo Statitis and, and others that clearly identify the value of using both hydrogen and ammonia for energy storage. Another case study was completed by the same group looking at modeling hydrogen and ammonia uh, for sustainable energy and agriculture. A key result was that this system could reduce the carbon intensity of both agriculture and power generation at a very low cost of $18 per ton of CO2. As for current research efforts in 2021, the university was part of a team that is, was awarded $12.5 million from the U.S. Department of Energy. With matching funds, the total product, project costs will be $18.63 million. It will be a state-of-the-art one metric ton per day ammonia production plant and will be constructed and tested at the research and outreach center where I work. In addition to hydrogen and ammonia production from wind and solar PV, the project will include a one kilowatt direct ammonia solid oxide fuel cell in which ammonia can, direct, can directly fuel the fuel cell without following the internal components. An ammonia cracker system located on board a, a PEM fuel cell powered forklift will be demonstrated. The cracker will reform ammonia back into pure hydrogen to be used within the hydrogen fuel cell. And then uh, the reason for the testimony today during the 2021 Minnesota legislative session, $10 million was appropriate, appropriated uh, for the purpose of leading research development advancement of energy storage systems that utilize hydrogen and ammonia production from renewables and other sources of clean energy. Funds may only be used for a portion of the project that are related to renewable power generation using ammonia directly as a fuel or as a carrier for hydrogen fuel and ultra safe storage of ammonia is also eligible. From this funding, a series of projects have been initiated. In the first our ammonia RDA project, we have partnered with a local utility to develop and demonstrate what we refer to as non-wire renewable solutions to sporadic load demands. These sporadic load demands could be from a large seasonal load, such as drain harvest, from increased development, such as a new manufacturing plant, or from new and disrupted loads, such as electric car charging and lake cabins. A portable green ammonia fueled engine gen set is being developed to place at key nodes and at, and at critical times. The critical nodes and times are being identified through modeling. The objective of this proposed research is organized into four tasks. Develop and demonstrate the operation of a 250 kW uh, scale mobile electric generator powered by ammonia. Develop and op develop optimization and control strategies for hybrid distributed energy systems that incorporate green ammonia and hydrogen production, storage and utilization for power generation. Evaluate the potential for incorporating ammonia storage and ammonia based gen sets in the power grid as non wire generation and grid stabiliz stabilization solutions. Engage a broad set of stakeholders to identify challenges and perceptions for adopting these solutions. Second project is titled Development of an Ultra Safe Ammonia Storage System. This is based upon absorbent technology developed at the, at the University of Minnesota Department of Chemical Engineering and Materials Science. Supported materials have been developed and tested for use in, in ammonia separation during production. However, these same materials show promise for stationary storage applications. These materials in particular could be used to minimize risks with storing ammonia in air, areas with higher population densities. Ammonia is an inhalation hazard, as many of the people from uh, rural areas understand. Uh, the storage vessel could sustain a major rupture without creating a public health crisis. It'll take both uh, heat or 
pressure or combination to release the ammonia. We are also currently discussing with Excel Energy and moving forward on a project in which ammonia will be used to fuel a HERSIG system within a combined cycle gas turbine power generation plant. I'll let uh, my colleague, Professor Northrup, discuss that in a little more detail. And finally, I'm considering a project in which we will test a portable ammonia fuel cell, uh, ammonia fueled fuel cell. To further describe the ammonia RDA power generation research, research, I wish to introduce my colleague, Dr. Will Northrup, who is a professor in the Department of, Chemical, of Mechanical Engineering at the Minneapolis campus. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Reese. I just wonder, I mean, you, you, uh, you told us so much. And I just offer, by the way, I've, I've traveled with Mr. Reese. Uh, when Mr. Reese walks in the room and starts talking about hydrogen, uh, <laughs> He is one of the most respected people in the world on this, and uh, and so we're lucky, so lucky to have you here with us today. But uh, I think we ought to, you know, you said so much, we ought to have a chance to maybe ask you some questions in terms Absolutely. of uh, of uh, what we heard, because I uh, it's I think so important for the future of energy, uh, certainly in our state and around the world, frankly. But uh, so so my first question is. Uh, as we, what what is what is the biggest impedance in terms of moving forward? Is this uh, is, I mean, we can make it from water, uh, and we got plenty of water, at least in Minnesota. Uh, why why aren't we even moving faster at this point? Do you think? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I really appreciate the comments. Especially I, as you know, I respect you a great great deal, and and uh, I would say that. Uh, when Senator Sengel walks in, there's just a tremendous amount of respect for, for him, much more than myself. But I, I will say that uh, I think the greatest uh, barrier is on the utilization side. We can produce it. We, uh, there's technologies to produce hydrogen. There's technologies to produce green ammonia. But uh, there seems to be a barrier for utilizing it. And that's one reason why I'm very excited about using some of the discussions at a federal level about incentivizing hydrogen production, because uh, at that point, I think the farmers in the state and others could start looking at using green ammonia for, as a fertilizer and replacing what they currently are uh, getting from the Gulf Coast or Canada or, or across the world. You know, Minnesota doesn't have any natural gas. We don't produce any synthetic nitrogen fertilizer within the state. This is a billion dollar industry and all those dollars are leaving the state right now. And so it's a tremendous opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I uh, like what has been done in the past with the ethanol industry. Many of you might cringe when you think about that, but it really, the, the policy format that was used to establish that uh, enabled success. And I think if you're looking for policy, I think that's a good model to look at for green hydrogen and green ammonia. And the, what the state can do is put Minnesota in, in a competitive, competitive posture so that when the federal government does come up with their hydrogen incentives that we can, that we can react quickly and decisively and, and be a leader in this area. And you know, we, we fully understand that the state of Minnesota has made a huge research investment in this area and we want to see that uh, yield results and yield you know, what was intended, the economic development uh, across the state moving forward. So we're willing to help in any way we can along those lines. Well, thank you, Mr. Reese. And I just have one more and I'll turn it over to the rest of the group. But uh, uh, when, when, when I'm participating in programs, so it, it's, it, it's always left that it's, uh, it's right now it's too expensive, but it's gonna get cheaper. And I, I, I always fail to understand what makes it so expensive right now, but it's going to get cheaper. Why is hydrogen so expensive right now? Uh, again, you know, the, the, the base resource is water and, of course, electricity. And we generally have plenty of both, uh, or at least we, if, we, if we have a will, we can make electricity. We've got the water. Yeah, what, the, what makes it so expensive? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the expense comes in the uh, electrolysis systems that are used to produce hydrogen. Uh, they are relatively small scale at this point in time. Uh, I believe Nell, one of the leading, world's leading electrolyzer companies came out just uh, within the last few days saying that they're gonna reduce the cost of electrolyzer 
That's 75%. That's, that's a huge decrease. And it's, it's all a matter of scaling up to get uh, economies of numbers. And it's such a small market right now that uh, we just don't have the economies of scale in manufacturing to, to, uh, to lower the costs. But even so, you know, I think that with the increase in natural gas prices today, that uh, green hydrogen would be cost competitive head-to-head uh, -head with conventional hydrogen, conventional sources. Uh, it's just that there's the market uncertainty with what the natural gas prices are going to do um, makes it difficult for capital to be deployed in that area. So if there's, and that's what, in my view, that's what the incentives incentives and policies are could be used to do with whether it's at a federal level or state level is to provide that certainty so that capital could be deployed by companies and, and financial institutions and farmers uh, and alike, you know, to, to take the next step forward. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Reese? Yes, Senator Friends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Mr. Reese. It's cool. Um, just so I followed up the chair's question, if I hear you correctly, if we had an ethanol type system, you feel hydrogen might be competitive for utilization now or soon. Um, if we don't, do you have a time frame you'd be willing to share with the committee where it become competitive once it scales up um, a month, a year, a hundred years? Anything you'd be willing to go on record for? <laughs> Mr. Reese? Thanks, thanks, Mr. Chair. It's dangerous to go on record for hydrogen because uh, what we've seen in the past is we've always been wrong. I think this time is different. I think the uh, there's so many factors coming together, whether you believe in climate change or not, whether you believe in uh, the risks that are out there in the you know the worldwide fossil fuel market. You know, I think all those risks come together to show that this is going to happen. And again, it's a matter of time. And I think from our, our role is to look for the kind of the best use cases, the early use cases. And from our perspective, or my perspective at least, it's green ammonia for fertilizer or pink ammonia, or there's a lot of, a lot of different colors of ammonia, but they're all, you know, pink is from nuclear power, green is from wind and solar and other renewables. So, you know, we're heading in that direction. And it's, it ne won't necessarily be kind of like wind energy now, it won't necessarily be because it's, it's uh, zero carbon, it'll be because it's just more cost effective. So well, follow up, anybody? Uh... Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Reed, I have one more. I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Um, did you say it's possible to use green hydrogen to capture CO2? Or did I hear, mishear you? That's correct. So you, you uh, there, there may be more. Uh, well, there's, there are several because you can, you can capture CO2 from the air, for example, and you can make ethanol. You don't need corn to make ethanol. It's a matter of, of whether it's cost, cost effective to do that. What, what uh, I'm suggesting might be a good use case is to use hydrogen, pull nitrogen from the air to produce green ammonia. And then uh, our ethanol plants uh, emit large volumes of CO2 uh, from fermentation. And it's a very pure form of CO2. A lot of the CO2 capture things you'll see for uh, coal plants or natural gas plants, you know, there's a lot of scrubbing involved in cleanup of that CO2. This is a very pure form of, of CO2. You can combine ammonia with that CO2 to produce urea. So urea and ammonia are the predominant nitrogen fertilizers used across the Midwest and US. Huge, huge markets for both of those. And uh, to me, that is a very attractive proposition of uh, Think, think of that think of that model where a ethanol plant wants to reduce its carbon intensity so it it's uh, uses green ammonia to capture the co2 to produce urea which then you know the ethanol plants are taking in corn uh, the farmers could bring back their ure the re urea to their farms and uh, we would not only lower the carbon intensity of ethanol we would significantly lower the carbon intensity of, of corn and small grain production uh, livestock production, dairy production, you know, all the way down the line. So, you know, I, I really believe that that is a, uh, something that the state or companies, farmers should, should be looking at tracking, especially 
with uh, the potential for federal incentives for hydrogen production, that would that would make it uh, a very attractive model. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, maybe one last one, maybe two last ones. Uh, uh, so you know, we're we're and you mentioned it actually the the idea of pipelines across uh, Iowa, et cetera, et cetera, going up in the Dakotas to capture uh, uh, CO2 off ethanol plants. Uh, it seems like you just offered an option. I don't know if it's a feasible option or not, but uh, uh, by having on-site electrolyzers at ethanol plants to, to go through the process you just mentioned, am I still following correctly? That I mean, in terms of a possibility, it may not be financially reasonable, but pipelines across states, are cost they cost a lot of money too. Yeah, there's billions of dollars going for uh, to capture CO2 at the ethanol plants and other places and then deliver it to you a well in North Dakota, and it's just going to go down in the well. There's no real value or use of it other than you're capturing CO2. In this, in this, with this concept, you'd actually be adding tremendous value to the CO2. And uh, whether it's at the ethanol plant or you're producing uh, ammonia at a nuclear plant or producing it at a wind farm, uh, ammonia is, is the second most transported chemical in the world. That's one of the benefits of, hydro, of ammonia is that and this process for energy storage is that you can transport it anywhere you want it and do so relatively inexpensively. So that that is uh, exactly what I'm saying. I, I would say why spend the money to send CO2 out to North Dakota when we can actually produce a product that we use here in Minnesota, uh, support our farms and grow our economy. It's, to me, it seems like a much better model. Uh, Mr. Easter, one, one last one. Of course, when you make, when you make hydrogen, you get oxygen. Uh, have, have you thought about or any, done any research on what you do with the oxygen? Just give it back to the air? Or, I mean, it's a, it's a valuable product. I, I think that's a great idea. We, we have not included that in our, in our modeling. I know you've brought it up in the past. Um, did your uh, past experience with Mayo Clinic? I, uh, we need to take a look at that. I don't think we're ready to look at it yet. Uh, to me, though, the, the economics uh, again, today will compete head to head with conventional ammonia. Uh, so at some level, uh, it's, it's like any refinery. As you establish the production, you look for other opportunities and oxygen would definitely be one of those that you want to take an early look at. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Uh, uh, welcome to the committee, uh, uh, Dr. Northrup, and uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your comments. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and um, committee members um, for this opportunity to talk about uh, a little bit more detailed work that I'm doing underneath uh, the bigger efforts that Mr. Reese was just explaining to you about uh, ammonia as a fuel. I, I just have a couple of slides there that thank you for putting those up. That's just my contact. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so just as an introduction of myself, so I've been a professor at University of Minnesota for, uh, well, since 2011. I have experience, quite a lot of experience in the, in the area of hydrogen and combustion um, through my graduate work, as well as uh, I worked actually in the, as, as Mr. Reese mentioned, hydrogen has been talked about for many, many years as a, as a viable alternative to um, conventional hydrocarbon fuels. Uh, in 1997, I worked in a fuel cell startup back in, in, in Boston where uh, when hydrogen and fuel cells were very, very popular all the way up through um, early 2000s in which then they sort of the demand sort of went down again. So I do believe we're on a cusp of something new with the hydrogen uh, um, research and the, and the motivation to continue this uh, work, especially with ammonia as an exciting uh, opportunity. I am a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Minnesota. I've also direct our, what's called the Thomas E. Murphy Engine Research Laboratory, which is a laboratory that's dedicated to um, investigating alternative fuels uh, for engines as well as other combustion devices. Our group is considered to be at the forefront um, internationally of ammonia and hydrogen combustion, largely, I would say, due to the funding from the state of Minnesota. So, um, and through my collaboration with Mr. Reese and others at the University of Minnesota, we have a very well-renowned uh, group of, of fundamental research uh, going on, um, both on the production side and in my group, the utilization side. So, um, 
I guess the utilization piece is my uh, expertise. Um, it's a real a bit of a chicken and egg as we were just discussing uh, what comes first, the production or the utilization in terms of uh, the technology development. But I can point out um, a couple of things that we're doing. Um, we, can, we can burn ammonia. Ammonia is a flammable uh, uh, gas when you burn it. It is, uh, it, it, it however has some challenges, which I've mentioned on the slide that you can see. It, it burns uh, alone, it burns quite slowly. So compared to natural gas, it's actually not, it's flammable, but not as flammable. <laughs> so um, mixing in with hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen is really advantageous um, and can be, uh, it can allow the ammonia to burn much the same way that um, natural gas can and, and, uh, and be retrofitted into things like engines or, or gas turbines, for example. Um, the other big challenge that we're addressing through our fundamental research at this moment is uh, the emissions of NOx. If, um, if you're familiar with oxides of nitrogen, mainly from diesel combustion, uh, that's been a talk for, uh, for, for decades. Uh, ammonia itself contains nitrogen, and so it provides another pathway for NOx to be formed from combustion. So this is an area where research is really um, uh, going on. Uh, we also are, of course, concerned with uh, fugitive ammonia emissions from combustion. Um, we don't want to be emitting it into the air, as well as looking at uh, N2O, uh, nitrous oxide. You might use it in your dentist's office, but as a, as a gas emitted into the environment, it's a greenhouse gas, much more powerful than CO2. So we want to make sure that we are um, eliminating both of those, or all three of those pollutants before they're emitted into the environment. So our research, as you can see in these, in these pictures, is starting off pretty um, small. These are, um, these are ammonia burners that are uh, being used to investigate different blends of hydrogen and ammonia that can be used in practical combustion devices. So on the upper right, you can see a turbulent burner that looks like kind of like a Bunsen burner type flame. Um, and you'll notice one thing about ammonia, and this is just from a, a fun science fact, is that ammonia burns orange. It doesn't burn blue. So if like your, like your kitchen stove would have a blue flame, um, a clean burning uh, natural gas flame is blue, a clean burning ammonia flame is orange. So uh, generally orange in a hydrocarbon flame means that you've got soot being created, but there is no soot from ammonia. It's, uh, it, there is no particle emissions. Um, and, uh, and so what you see is this sort of bright orange uh, flame. On the bottom, you see a picture of what we call a flat flame, which is a very fundamental um, way to look at how ammonia and hydrogen can burn together uh, at, and what, at a what speed and with what um, chemistry. So the flat flame is really quite beautiful. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very thin uh, layer of flame that you can set up um, inside a, a burner device. So the, you might ask the question, you know, so why do we care about these fundamental um, you know, burners and how does it relate to say a gas turbine, for example, or an engine? Um, our laboratory is looking all the way through the um, technology readiness level scale, all the way from these fundamental burners, all the way up through integrating the, the, um, the projects that uh, Mr. East was just talking about with regards to the, um, the, the engine combustion and the generator set that, we're, that we'll be integrating at our laboratory, as well as the, uh, the work that we'll be doing to run the combined cycle power plants to look at how we can use ammonia and hydrogen mixtures in a, in a combined cycle power plant. So within these projects, um, we plan to evolve this sort of basic flame research all the way through to burning uh, ammonia and hydrogen mixtures in uh, a 200 kilowatt uh, gen set that will be um, distributed power generation as, as we've discussed. Uh, and we really hope to, to demonstrate that in, in the next year or so. So this is a, a rapid development, especially for university lab, um, and one that we're, that we're really uh, excited about to keep us at the forefront of this, uh, this research. And one more piece I'd like to, to mention is that, as, I noted, as I, I noted here and I have it in the slide, that hydrogen is necessary, green hydrogen is necessary to ensure that ammonia can burn efficiently in, in these practical devices. Um, hydrogen can be blended in either directly uh, if, if you have a hydrogen source, but and oftentimes if you're transporting hydrogen to a remote location, you don't have that ability. So uh, the University of Minnesota and my group has developed intellectual property um, that is uh, to use exhaust waste heat, so a heat that's wasted by these combustion devices like engines, to decompose a portion of the ammonia into hydrogen and ammonia mixture that can be used uh, to retrofit these devices. So 
Um, these compact re reactor devices are very similar to say like an after treatment catalyst that you'd see on, a, uh, on any like gas turbine power plant or in an engine, um, but can be used to enable 100% ammonia combustion. Um, you know, uh, what, you know, coming into the engine. So, uh, yeah, with that, I guess I, I'll open to any questions. So thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members, and um, uh, I'm excited to answer any questions you might have on the technical side. Uh, any questions of Dr. Northup? And you're eligible too, uh, Senator <laughs> Goggins. Welcome to the committee. <laughs> well, with that, Mr. Chair, I will ask a question. Sure. Uh, when ammonia burns, what's the uh, temperature that it typically burns at? Um, it, it, it burns at a similar temperature to natural gas, but maybe a little lower. So, you know, we're talking the, uh, depends on the mixture and whether you blend it with air, but in the thousand degree C range, um, Celsius, we're talking Fahrenheit, 20, <laughs> you know, to 2000 range of Fahrenheit. So yes, yeah, so it burns similar temperature to, uh, to, uh, hydrocarbon flames at natural gas, especially when blended with hydrogen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Goggins. Any, anybody, committee? So, so, so I have a, my my question is uh, so so you you have ammonia obviously ammonia burns uh, hydrogen uh, burns as well. Uh, if you have a gas turbine uh, wanting to spin electricity, uh, and perhaps we'll hear this more from the XL people themselves. But what 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 would you use? What what would your fuel fuel be used? Uh, what would you use as a fuel in the future? Uh, Oh, thank you for that would, question, would you, Mr. Chair. You, you, um, yeah, so yeah, I, I I think that our our connections with gas turbine manufacturers um, like General Electric, um, they're o they're open to using a variety of different fuels. They're trying to play the field, so so to speak, with regards to which fuel would be optimal. Um, they are uh, looking at hydrogen right now as a, a direct replacement of natural gas in in their gas turbines. But I believe that uh, the ammonia uh, hydrogen blend could be um, just as advantageous as a pure hydrogen. In fact, it could be better because um, you are able to um, slow the, the hydrogen actually is quite a fast burning fuel. And so um, ammonia hydrogen mixtures might actually be more similar to the conventional um, you know, natural gas type combustion. So I think, I think there's not necessarily an ideal fuel to be burned in a gas turbine, but I think that there's, uh, but, but there's some certain advantages to using ammonia hydrogen mixtures. Uh, Dr. North, if, if you burn, you know, uh, ammonia, would not you get, uh, you know, an some NOx that you'd have to deal with at least from sampling and pollution control? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the um, the 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 NOx emissions would be a, a factor. However, one has to under uh, to realize that um, if you were to burn hydrogen by itself, the temperatures that hydrogen burns at, um, which we were just discussing, are quite a bit higher than the temperatures that 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 ammonia or natural gas would burn. So, NOx emissions uh, just from nitrogen in the air would be also quite high. So. Sure. NOx emissions are a concern, I think, from the perspective of both hydrogen and from ammonia fuel. So, I and 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 further, I think that uh, well, I know that that after treatment catalysts like selective catalytic reduction are already being used by Excel and others in their in their power plants to reduce NOx before it gets emitted from the stack. And so, these technologies would be readily just transferred right over to ammonia combustion. So, I don't I don't necessarily think that there would be a, a an issue there. Um, but it does require additional research and sort of this fundamental study. Okay, any, any further questions or any questions? Anything else you want to leave us with? <laughs> Just want to thank you again, Mr. Chair, for bringing attention to the possibilities and the opportunity that uh, hydrogen and ammonia bring to Minnesota. Again, it, uh, developing an industry like this or developing uh, hydrogen and ammonia could touch every corner of the state and every major industry. We're going from agriculture to construction to transportation to utility, both electric and, and uh, thermal or gas utilities. So uh, there is definitely potential there. And, and our, our challenge is just try to keep Minnesota, and I, your challenge as well, try to keep Minnesota in a leadership position moving forward. So thank you. Oh, uh, thank you both. Uh... Thank you, especially uh, Mr. Reese for driving in from Morris. Uh, it's a long way, and uh, you got a long way back. But, and uh, certainly Dr. Northrup, thank you for being here as well. So, thank you. okay, uh, let's move on to hear the uh, 
the Excel story. Uh, and uh, with us today, we have uh, Rick Evans and, uh, and Dan Ludwig, uh, uh, both from Excel, and uh, they're going to tell us about uh, what they have going on at, at Excel Energy with respect to the hydrogen and uh, those kind of activities that uh, I believe we have a pilot project. <laughs> Thank you. So, Mr. Welcome Mr. to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Rick Evans with, with Excel Energy. Uh, I'm going to have just a, a couple of very short comments on the, on the first uh, two slides um, to introduce the company, though I know that everyone on this uh, committee, we've, we've been here plenty of times, so I, I'm not going to take a lot of time at it. Uh, so, as you know, we're the largest electric utility in the state of Minnesota. We serve uh, five states, uh, counting a little bit of uh, Michigan in our uh, upper Midwest service territory, and then have service territory in Colorado, Texas, and New Mexico as well. Uh, here in Minnesota, we are the, is the only part of the Excel service territory that has nuclear plants, which is central to the discussion that Mr. Ludwig is going to have. Go to the next slide. Uh, you're all aware of the, uh, the, uh, uh, our, our efforts to get to 80% uh, uh, reduction in carbon by 2030. And as we heard last week in our IRP presentation, we've actually already achieved that goal. Uh, we have an aspirational goal of getting to 100% carbon free by 2050. Uh, I think we've also explained to the committee that at this point, um, that's not achievable with current technology. And so that goal depends on uh, new technologies that will allow us to, to reach it. Um, among those is very likely going to have to be firm dispatchable resources that are carbon free. And uh, this is where we see hydrogen as offering a, a, a real opportunity. Um, as I think, uh, Mr. Chair, you mentioned, it takes a lot of energy to make hydrogen. And of course, if you make the hydrogen using energy that emits carbon, you're sort of defeating the purpose. And so uh, this uh, leads right into the uh, project that Mr. Ludwig is going to talk about. And with, uh, uh, with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Daniel Ludwig and uh, let him proceed. Thank you. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Mr. Ludwig. Uh, appreciate uh, being here today. And uh, please introduce yourself and, uh, and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, committee, for having us today. Uh, Dan Ludwig, I'm a senior engineer in our nuclear innovation group at Xcel Energy. I've been with the company for about nine years, uh, working on this exciting hydrogen project. And as Rick just explained, we have this uh, aspirational goal of carbon-free, 100% carbon-free electricity by 2050. And we have a very clear path to the 80% carbon emission reduction by 2030. But that last 20% is where it gets uh, really hard. And so what we're talking about, like Rick mentioned, is looking into hydrogen. Um, and I'd like to thank our previous presenters uh, uh, that did a great job. Mike walked through this graph in the, one of the better descriptions I've heard. Um, I'll just show some pictures because I, I can't speak nearly as eloquently as Mike can. So uh, just if you can follow my cursor here on the screen, um, you know, we're looking at all kinds of options to get to carbon free um, by 2050. Um, listed there on the left, but I'm just gonna talk about hydrogen today. So how do you make hydrogen? So typically hydrogen is made through steam methane reformation. You use natural gas and it emits a carbon dioxide. So how would an, an alternative, we'd like to make carbon free hydrogen, sometimes referred to as green hydrogen um, in some circles. So you take an electricity source such as renewables or nuclear, or if you use um, fossil fuel, like for example, natural gas with carbon capture and sequestration, uh, you make electricity. Uh, from that electricity, you then use a process called electrolysis, which splits the hydrogen and the oxygen from the water, and you get hydrogen out. And the reason why we're so excited is not about potentially making hydrogen is there's so many different uses there are for it. Uh, for example, uh, we're electric utility, like power generation, you can burn it in a turbine, as they were describing, either burn hydrogen, mix hydrogen with natural gas, mix it with ammonia, there are a lot of options there. Um, or in a fuel cell, and similarly, you know, ammonia to a fuel cell, hydrogen to a fuel cell, there are a lot of different ways to look at it there. And so you could simply use electricity to make hydrogen and turn it back to the grid as kind of a, a long storage battery. Uh, there are challenges with storing hydrogen, but you can store it for a long time. So there's a, a real benefit, potential benefit there for hydrogen. Also looking at the bottom of this graph, you can mix hydrogen into the gas infrastructure to help decarbonize 
the natural gas, uh, home heating, for example, or using in your house. So there's some real built-in already things we are using in the, in the industry for making power and you know, heating homes where hydrogen can be plugged in. And then on the right side of this graph, there's a bunch of other industries outside of the typical utility sector where you can use hydrogen. Uh, Mike did a great job of talking about ammonia and fertilizer, you know, add in some nitrogen, maybe add in some CO2 to make urea. That's another great use of hydrogen right now. One that probably gets a lot of press in the top here is, you know, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. Well, not, you know, right now in, Colorado, or in California, you can go out and buy a Toyota Mirai or some sort of different vehicle that's a hydrogen fuel cell car. Um, not as many here right now, but that's another potential use for hydrogen. Kind of working my way down, synthetic fuels is another one. Uh, combining hydrogen with CO2 for perhaps from an ethanol plant, uh, you can make a synthetic replacement, a, a plug and play replacement for a fossil fuel. Um, one of the most promising ones here is called sustainable aviation fuel. So how do you decarbonize flight? You know, if you could put a battery on an airplane it'd be a very heavy battery, it's hard to fly with heavy things. Uh, putting hydrogen in an airplane is difficult because it takes up a lot of space. Uh, so if you can make a sustainable aviation fuel where you combine hydrogen with a carbon neutral uh, carbon source, you could help decarbonize flight. I'm not gonna go through all the rest of these, but you can just see that there's a lot of different applications for where you could use hydrogen and help decarbonize other sectors outside the utility sector. So just to talk a little bit more about what we're doing at Excel Energy in this space, uh, we've made a consortium with two other utilities, Energy Harbor out of Ohio and Arizona Public Service out of Arizona, as well as Idaho National Lab to explore integrating nuclear power with hydrogen. Uh, it's a multi-phase approach and we're kind of looking at all different aspects of hydrogen at the same time. So Xcel Energy is involved in phase one and phase two. And I'll just kind of walk through these phases briefly. And I'm gonna throw out some words here that I'm gonna draw more attention to in the next slide, but in phase one, Energy Harbor is doing a low temperature electrolysis demonstration. Uh, and we completed a technical and economic assessment of future hydrogen use in our area, in our region, and what it lo would look like as far as costs and kind of what the scale could be. In phase two, the project that I'll be spending more time talking about in just a second, we're doing a high temperature steam electrolysis demonstration. The key difference here between low temperature and high temperature is that the high temperature system will use 30% less electricity to make the hydrogen. As was mentioned previously, it takes a lot of electricity to turn water into hydrogen and oxygen. So if you can reduce the cost, the amount of electricity used by 30%, you can dramatically reduce the, the cost of the hydrogen by about 30%. It's the electricity is really the driving factor in the cost of hydrogen. And just going down through the other phases here, Arizona Public Service in phase three is doing a very large scale, a much larger scale demonstration of low temperature electrolysis. Uh, our system, just to give some numbers to the scale, in phase one, Energy Harbor is doing, a, I think a one to two megawatt system. We're doing about 150 kilowatt system. So another size down. Arizona Public Service is doing a 20 megawatt system. So it's much bigger. And their, their project will be blending, um, blending hydrogen in a gas turbine and burning it to help demonstrate decarboniz decarbonizing a gas turbine. On the note of scale, the reason why we're doing such a smaller scale project than the other projects is that the technology for high temperature electrolysis is much less developed than low temperature electrolysis. As was mentioned previously, we, we expect the costs for electrolysis units to come down. And for high temperature electrolysis, they're even higher on the learning curve. So there's a lot more cost reduction yet to be made. So as the manufacturing comes up and you get bigger plants, more times of scale, we really expect these costs to come down over time. One of the key things I wanna bring up of why we're all interested in pairing nuclear power with hydrogen, all three of us companies and others that are looking at it, is that as you all know, nuclear plants uh, run 24 seven around the clock. Uh, as was discussed previously with running uh, hydrogen plants with wind or solar, while great, uh, while a great opportunity, the wind and solar, you know, the sun shines when it shines, the wind blows when it blows, it's hard to control. Um, and so 
the amount of time you can make hydrogen is limited to when the electricity is being made. Now, as we make more and more, put more and more renewables on the grid, there's more and more times when if there's, we may make more electricity than we need. And at Excel Energy, we've actually been, uh, we call it flexing our nuclear plants, where we'll actually reduce the output of our nuclear plant to allow some of that renewable generation to come onto the system. Um, and looking forward, as we build more and more renewables, there could be more times when that happens. And so instead of turning down our nuclear plant, what if we just use that extra electricity to make hydrogen? So we could essentially store that energy that we make from the nuclear plant. So really we see this as a great um, collaboration with nuclear and renewables to work together to really maximize how we can decarbonize the system. Uh, so now I'll talk some details about our specific project at Prairie Island. Uh, we have a Department of Energy uh, grant. It's a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy for about $14 million. Um, and like I said before, we'll be putting in this high temperature steam electrolysis skid. We'll likely be doing the project at Prairie Island. Uh, on this picture here, uh, I'll walk through the picture here if you can follow my cursor. The, uh, on the left here, or on the top of the picture is your typical nuclear power plant simplified drawing. And the bottom part is the hydrogen plant that we'll be building at the nuclear plant. So, uh, and drawing not to scale, uh, when I say hydrogen plant, nuclear plant, the nuclear plant is very large. The hydrogen plant is about the size of a semi-trailer, so very small. So just to get your mind around kind of what it looks like uh, if you were to see it. So just to explain how the nuclear plant works, um, inside of the containment building over here, we have the nuclear reactor, which heats up water, and that goes to a large heat exchanger, and it kind of goes in a circle. On the other side of that heat exchanger, we take uh, water that gets heated up, gets turned into steam, goes through this, turns the turbine, turns the generator, makes electricity, and sends the power out to the grid. That water, after it turns the turbine, gets cooled back down through a condenser and goes through the process again. So that's the very, very high level how the nuclear plant works. What we'll be doing is we'll be taking electricity generated by the plant to run our electrolysis unit down here. It's called our steam electrolysis unit. We'll also be taking steam made from the plant and that steam will come out of the plant and will go to a heat exchanger. We'll be taking some water from the plant and go through the heat exchanger. The steam from the plant will heat up this water and it'll actually vaporize the water. So it'll turn it to steam and this water will then go to the electrolysis unit. That steam will then be split through the electrolysis process using electricity to turn into hydrogen and oxygen um, and then that'll be our hydrogen. Uh, we'll be making about 90 kilograms a day of hydrogen, which like I said before, this is very small scale. Um, a large scale hydrogen process talks about thousands of tons per day of hydrogen. So really the goal of this project is really to demonstrate that we can implement this technology at a nuclear plant. We can follow all the regulations. We can follow all the process, the permitting, work with the DOE, do all, follow all the requirements and actually make it work. This sort of work where you do something at a nuclear plant other than make electricity just isn't done. So this is really a cutting edge, you know, across the world, across the US for sure, across the world. Other, other companies are talking about it, but we're actually doing it, taking steam electricity out of the nuclear plant to make another product. And so we really see this as vital going forward to show that this can be done so that you know, future work, we can lay the groundwork for future work. Uh, I've talked a lot about you know, big and small. Um, so just to try to put some context into what big and small mean. Uh, the, our Prairie Island nuclear plant powers you know, about a million homes between the two reactors. The amount of electricity we'll be making, be using to make this electrolysis plant is enough to power about 150 homes. So it's a very small amount of the uh, nuclear plant output. And if we were to make 90 kilograms a day of hydrogen, what could you do with that 90 kilograms a day? Let's say you had a hydrogen powered car and we had a hydrogen powered fill up station at the nuclear plant. You could drive, uh, drive in there and fill up your five kilogram gas tank 18 times and you could drive for over 5,000 miles, which that sounds like, hey, that's a lot of energy, right? It's a lot of hydrogen. Well, any industrial process, you know, it's not really much. It's kind of a drop in the bucket. So it is a very small scale demonstration. 
really just a proof of concept to validate that we can work through all the process and make sure we can get to where all come together and make the hydrogen we wanna make. Uh, on the schedule, uh, we were notified of the award on 10-8-2020. Uh, uh, for those of you who didn't celebrate it, October 8th every year is National Hydrogen Day. It's 1.008 is the atomic mass of hydrogen, so 10-8. It's kind of a good nerd joke for all your friends. Um, so uh, next, October 8th, celebrate it, National Hydrogen Day. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Energy uh, to get that contract up and running. Um, this is one of our first forays into getting a grant from the Department of Energy to do this kind of work. So it's been a lot of legwork work to understand the requirements and we expect to start that project uh, first quarter 2022. So really, we're getting really close to getting going. It's a two year project. Um, so we'll be doing our engineering and preparation work this year um, into the third quarter of 2023 when you expect to, the unit to arrive on site uh, and we'll have all of our testing complete um, by the first quarter of 2024. Uh, and with that, uh, that's the end of my slides for today. I appreciate the time and I'd be happy to take questions. Okay, any questions, uh, Mr. Ludwig? Uh, I'll start for one, just long-term would, uh, would XL or any, any utility perhaps look at hydrogen as being in the, the, you know, the long-term storage media for, for you know, intermittent power? To, yeah. Looking at long-term potentials, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can look at using hydrogen, and, and many utilities are discussing that. So it, it's definitely a potential that is being considered by many. Anybody else? Sorry, uh, Senator Friends, yes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ludwig. Um, my colleague, Senator Matthews, is always telling me I have to look more carefully at nuclear. I appreciate your um, explanation, uh, and I, I guess... The point I would want to make is nuclear is a carbon free source. So those of us that are always yelling about the need to decarbonize, wherever you had nuclear power, you have to raise it up in your estimation. Doesn't mean it fits into our long-term plan, but I believe it deserves a chance to run experiments like this. Although I complained about the size of the font um, <laughs> uh, that I couldn't read it. And I guess um, the reason I wanted to comment, uh, Mr. Chair, is I think this is exactly the kind of uh, options we should be looking at at this committee. Let's take a look, let's see what we think, let's do some experiments. Maybe someone will think of something really cool, you know, that we hadn't thought of before. And um, for that reason, I just want to thank XL and you, Mr. Ludwig, for, you know, bringing it forward. Who knows what we think? We got a little time. Let's figure it out. How's that, Senator Matthews? <laughs> With that, Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that's a good start. So that'll help lead to good, some good future conversations. I have a question um, based on one of your slides that I'd like you to expound on a little bit. Um, your graph on the amount of hydrogen you'd be producing a day and how it would measure out and uh, your graph on kind of the picture of how it would work in the nuclear plant. How much electricity is consumed in making that much hydrogen and how does that relate to a comparison of the amount of energy that hydrogen ultimately uh, is used for at the end. What would that uh, cost benefit ratio be for the, the energy consumed in the making of hydrogen? Mr. Ludwig? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. The, so I think you're asking about the, the round trip efficiency, kind of like what's the total picture of um, the energy that you're using to make hydrogen, the amount of energy that's in that hydrogen that you've made. I'd have to follow up with you on the exact numbers. Um, there are some you know, losses in the system as you're obviously going through and converting from electricity to hydrogen and then back to electricity again. Um, I think you know, there's some, as the technology gets better, that efficiency will increase. I've seen numbers in the literature from 50 to 60%. That's kind of, if you were to take it hydrogen, electricity to hydrogen back through a fuel cell, there's a, a phrase, and, and Arizona Public Service is actually looking into, the, into this in detail about um, reversible fuel cells. So it's electrolysis and fuel cell on one piece of equipment. Um, and so it's in that you know, 50 to 60% round trip efficiency, um, but they, they expect those numbers to increase as it gets more research. And like I said, kind of beginning this high temperature steam electrolysis system is, is really, um, I'd say novel, very cutting edge, and they expect a lot of increases 
decreases in cost as well as increase in efficiency. Senator, yes. Follow, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that. And maybe, maybe to uh, a good halfway answer to a question uh, for the, the you know the entirety efficiency question. But maybe a good halfway one would be like, how much do you estimate uh, will be consumed just making the 90 kilograms a day? And then I think you started alluding to it. Do you think? Uh, do you think that number gets smaller as the technology advances and as we hopefully figure out this system? Um, that's also for down the road in discussion that I think I'd be interested in. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Comments, Mr. Ludwig? Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chair, thank you. The, um, so it's 150 kilowatts gets you the 90 kilograms a day. And so that is approximately 30% less if then that's using that high temperature steam electrolysis system that we plan to pilot, um, as compared to if you were using low temperature electrolysis system, it would take about 30% more electricity to make that same amount of hydrogen. Anyone else, members? Senator Goggins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, previous testifiers mentioned uh, the catalyst uh, for the production process is more or less the big challenge I, I take it. So if you could just uh, expand on that a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Yes, Mr. Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so um, the different ways of making electrolysis, there's uh, several different technologies and depending on which technology you use, you need different, um, different materials in it. Um, and so in low temperature electrolysis, one of the um, primary methods is called um, PEM, uh, polymer exchange membrane. Um, and the, in that you need platinum and iridium, which are, um, if you're familiar with those, they're very, um, very expensive, hard to come by, limited quantities uh, that you have to mine. In a high temperature steam electrolysis, you don't need to use either of those. Um, so there's there, one of the other benefits of high temperature steam electrolysis is that you're not reliant on very selective catalysts. The materials you need to use are much more widely available. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ludwig and Mr. Evans, for being with us today. Uh, an interesting look at, I think, the future. <laughs> and uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, with that, unless there are any other questions, uh, we meet next Tuesday. I know we've talked about two or three bills and uh, we'll have up. So it'll be bill day next, uh, next Tuesday at uh, three o'clock. So at this point, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>